Hi Internet, it's been a year since I've uploaded a video on this channel and um, I just want to say welcome to all the new bunch of you who have joined. It's uh, very much appreciated and I'm glad that you enjoy my work. I wanted to show you something which may or may not become a podcast in the future, uh, but this is a particular episode which we filmed and yeah, I just really hope you guys enjoy it. I think you'll get a lot out of it. And I'm not going to say much more. Take it away. I have with me John here today. Hello, John. How are you doing? Hello, Tyler. Doing terrific. <laughs> Easiest way to start, I feel, John, is if you just explain who you are and what you do. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> uh, my pleasure. So um, <laughs> who I am is I'm somebody who's really passionate about creativity. I think that's the kind of almost uh, my kind of identifying characteristic. It's something I absolutely love. It brings me so much joy. And what I, I do is uh, I work professionally for an accountancy firm as a learning uh, training solution provider. So I create things like e-learns, workshops and programs. But outside of work, I design board games and comics. And I also um, have a little show on Twitch where we do some experimental stuff. But I really love that exciting feeling of like when you've opened up a new box of Lego and there's just so many possibilities of new things to do. That's what really fires me up. <laughs> so creating new things. And um, for anyone who is wondering if you ever go around to John's house, it is just filled to the rim with <laughs> board games and other games and <laughs> everything. <laughs> it, it, it really is. And there's a section as well, which I particularly like with um, kind of board game components. So one mm. thing that I really love to do is to take ingredients of existing games, um, little kind of meeples and figures and, and counters and dice and mix them all up and see what you can make with those um, ingredients like and cook up a new game so yeah that's an, another thing that's uh, you'll find plenty of in my house <laughs> uh so yeah that that brings us in i think perfectly is um i think a lot of us when we're younger we kind of have those you know things with modeling and like board games and stuff and it's stuff which we're told to try and play with and try and do but we don't seem to have that so much as adults we're kind of at that point like oh we must behave we must be working and stuff and i i yeah, I was just wondering how you think as adults, like we should continue doing this and why it's important. Yeah, I think it's um, oh, it, it, it's a huge topic. I think the kind of the story that we take as given at the moment with kind of inner children is, is very much, as you say, like as a child, you're allowed to play with the crayons and, and you're allowed to do kind of pictures and do whatever you want. But then maybe around the time of puberty and as things get a bit more serious in school, your crayons almost get taken away and it's kind of like more serious things like you, know, you have to do algebra and, um, and, I, and I love algebra as, as, as an ex-mathematician, but you know, it seems like you get less time with the crayons. So I think it's important to, to have that um, connection with your inner child because I think it's really good for identifying your passions. So I think that... Um, there's a course actually that, that we've done at work, um, which was called Genius Power Dreams, where you look at what made you really happy as a child and you use that to help you in your um, in your career and, so, and, and at work. So if you realize you really enjoyed um, solving puzzles, like maybe you could use that in a, in a new way in your work environment. So um, that's one example. Or maybe you really enjoyed storytelling. Storytelling is a huge part of um, professional skills these days. So you can actually use that in a, in a different way. And I find that really exciting because childhood is awesome. Like that's the best time of your life. I mean, you get to, to run around and play and use your imagination, which is like a mil multi-million dollar Hollywood studio that we all carry around in our heads. And I suppose it comes down to, to like, if I was being all serious and worky, I'd say, well, it unlocks your passion and motivation, but mm -hmm. also it's just really fun and good for your well-being. I think. So there's a kind of a few kind of uh, ideas there. Um, but yeah, I, I'd be curious to know about your own sort of experiences. Like where do you see your, your kind of inner child um, coming to play in what you do? Well, um, I mean, interestingly, I thought just while you were talking about that, I'll grab. Uh, uh, so basically right on my desk right here. I'm so uh, curious as to what this is. <laughs> this is my Hornby set Thomas the Tank Engine. It still exists today. Um, oh, <laughs> so I, I still I couldn't get rid of it. I had so much. What attachment a gem. To, I know. <laughs> um but yeah, no, this was like kind of, you've just, <laughs> you're almost making me think now, this is what I was really passionate about when I was younger was trains and like models and stuff. <laughs> it's like, oh, I wonder how that comes into my current world. Um, and I guess the thing is, I liked the idea of making worlds with that, I think. So that's kind of how film and stuff ends up coming into that is that you get to make worlds still potentially, you just make it in a different way. Interestingly, I've gone down a very documentary route 
with that. But um, yeah, I think the idea of making worlds and telling stories was always something which I was very passionate about. Um, I had as a child in primary school so many imagination stories and like kind of I think as I remember I was in primary school and basically by um you could look out across Bristol and there was this just pipe it's just a, a chimney pipe or something like that a big chimney pipe which you could see in Bristol and I pretended that was like some ship which was coming in that we were at war and stuff and like oh it's like oh the soldiers oh like <laughs> and like me and my a uh, couple of my friends just somehow that entertained us for weeks just this kind of idea of the ship coming in it was like ah oh, it's a battle and stuff and then we'd win the battle or something after a few weeks and then we'd have a sleepover celebrating the fact that we'd won. <laughs> that was like literally, I was like, how did I manage to do that? I wish I could do that th these days. That's so fun. <laughs> like, that, that's amazing. Yeah. I love the, kind of the drama of that and the sense yeah. of celebrating a victory yeah. with your friends as well. That yeah. sounds like it's such a, a magical, like triumphant <laughs> experience to have as kids. Um, I think I think I can relate to that. I'm sure our listeners can uh, as well. Um, mm -hmm. Like uh, I, I remember when I was walking uh, with my family, I'd often uh, sort of go for walks in the Lake District and uh, lovely places like that. And uh, I'd often be walking ahead of my parents um, and I'd, I'd get a little bit, I don't know, restless in my mind and it would just wander. And sometimes I'd think about, well, what if I found a, a magic sword? What if I just kind of w walked off the path a little bit and maybe um, found like a, a mysterious old wizard or, or like I don't know, a dragon? And what if out of this kind of like mound of rubble in the, um, in, in the hillside, a, a huge kind of like snake's head erupted? It would, it would always be playing these almost cinematic kind of moments. And it was just really fun to kind of run with them and i find that it is it's harder and harder as 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 adults to kind of make the space for that mm -hmm. kind of wanderings it's it's so easy to sort of like um fill your um kind of like your mind up with media and consuming and not allow yourself almost the boredom that gets you to using your imagination if that makes sense so sometimes yeah. it's good to just um yeah create that space yeah um so how would you say you get into that space in the modern world if you're like oh i want to make a board game or i want to make this story like how do you get into that headspace of like right creative inner child <laughs> yeah uh, so <laughs> if i think about um uh, the latest game that i've been working on it's something called earth and war and it's mm -hmm. about golems um fighting each other and using magic mm -hmm. uh and th that was created by me and my, my good friend peter kizik who i went to school with sitting down on the floor and imagining that i think it was some coins were maybe battleships or robots and this um big bit of paper we're imagining the ocean i think we we, we said it was so just thinking about what the cardboard could be and being okay to sit on the floor and being okay to be comfortable with um, having to take that imaginative leap. So we, I think uh, it, we needed a certain willingness to to sit on the floor and feel a bit silly as well. I mean, like uh, as adults, it's not every day you kind of do that and like literally pretend that things are other things. Um, but, but it was actually really fun as well. I think that um, sometimes we need almost a bit of permission to to be like a child. We don't allow ourselves to be like that. There's kind of so many kind of expectations. Um, I sometimes think about this with um, things like martial arts, where you don't have a chance for like play fighting. I really like the way lion cubs kind of like rough and tumble mm. and like uh, tussle at each other. You don't get the same chance to, to do that as adults, um, especially when you're like six foot like us do. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I was going to say, um, it, come every say day. it only happens when there's a lot of alcohol involved and it's not for good reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you have to be careful and responsible obviously yeah. but um i think uh yeah i think we just need to be conscious of it i suppose so even just by having this conversation with you tyler like it's making me think that like i should make time in my life little pockets maybe hours with friends or by mm. myself to just take that time to ex connect with my inner child yeah no i mean it's interestingly it's made me thought about kind of one of the ways how i think i get very imaginative which is interestingly through music um I don't know why I'm I'm someone who kind of daydreams a lot with music. I go very much into my own mind. So if I if um, in fact people have seen me before with headphones in and they try and wave it and I don't see them because I'm just seeing other stuff. I'm like just totally in another world of imagination. Um, <laughs> and I guess that's how I kind of release my inner child in some ways is just going into this kind of music world and seeing music videos and stuff 
in my head, which don't exist in real life, but they, <laughs> but I wish they did. That's all I say. <laughs> that's that's awesome. So it's almost <laughs> connecting to your passion of filmmaking in, in a way that that kind of visual storytelling <laughs> that you see from um, listening to music. I yeah. certainly relate to that. Um, I think it's. Uh, like uh, something I noticed as, as a, a child when we listening to music, I don't know if you did that thing where you kind of look out the window and you imagine a guy running along uh, at the motorway or, or along the road, kind of jumping over bridges and fields. I certainly did. And I remember listening to um, some music by the prodigy and imagining this like big robot warrior kind of like running alongside the car and like leaping over different things. And, and yeah, it was the music that kind of like brought that to life. Um, and, and to this day, I like you listening to music, it can be such a powerful source of um, inspiration and um, and a, a great stimulus for just different thinking. It like taps right into your core, doesn't it? And um, gives you uh, that supercharge of emotion and feeling. Um, and and yeah, you, you, it, it, it's one of those things that it's just so important to make the time and space for um, and, and be kind of conscious with it as well. So what, one thing I like to do is just um, get blank sheets of paper and uh, let my imagination go riot. So one thing that um, I think is a bit different about me as a creator is that when I was at university, I didn't have a laptop. It's taken as given now that how could you not be at university without a laptop? It seems like everyone has one as an extension of themselves. But I um, uh, always made time in the evenings to have a blank sheet of paper, normally some music playing, and just see what, what happened. I think it's almost something like... I'm not a uh, creative superhero, but if I was, that might be the origin story of like um, just kind of all these evenings of um, kind of just uh, coming up against that blank sheet of paper. And that that led me to do a lot of um, early st stories and, and draft ideas for novels, um, poems, uh, games, and uh, I suppose kind of like philosophies as well. Um, so I think um, having that almost forced upon me discipline of maybe being a little bit bored in retrospect actually led to me uh, really taking great pleasure in the exploration of um, the, 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 the white blank page. Well, that reminds me, um, in the first lockdown, right, you attempted to write a novel, right? <laughs> You're absolutely right. Yeah, I did yeah. Um, uh, what's uh, known as NaNoWriMo, which you may or may not be familiar with, the uh, National Novel Writing Month, which originated in the States. And uh, it was a really um, fulfilling uh, diversion to, to kind of chip away at, uh, at writing a novel and to, to write every day. And I uh, I did complete, I think, 30,000 words. I think 50,000 is the kind of official target. But for me, as a personal goal, that, that represented so much because um, I've written many short stories, but I've never written something as, as long as that. And it's, it's a first draft. It's raw. It needs rework. But it is great to almost have seen that the full arc come through um i'm really passionate about um the different models that there are for storytelling so you may be familiar with the hero's journey and yeah. and the three act and five act structure i'm yeah. sure you are from your filmmaking um, <laughs> yeah we learn about them in film studies <laughs> yeah, yeah I, 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 i've come to to love that in in, in um in, in storytelling as well. And I, I really had a good crack at the five act structure um, with my story, which is about math students fighting a monster made of fractals that was running around a university library. It was, it was, it was really fun to write. Mm. That's like a full on Roll Dahl type of level <laughs> when you've got like, yeah, young, yeah. yeah. <laughs> got, got to love Roll Dahl. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Tales of the Unexpected, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I hoped actually kind of um, to do almost like a modern D and D style thing with it. In the end, I was, I was wondering about what if my characters kind of didn't just fight fractal monsters, but they fought kind of like high concept monsters from maybe philosophy or from English, like a metaphorical monster. What would that be? Um, maybe some sort of conceptual stuff. But uh, yeah, we'll save that for next November. We'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be excited to read it whenever it comes out. I guess. <laughs> we'll Thank you. Yeah. I, I would love to, to to share it with you. Um, I suppose that's maybe another thing to acknowledge that like, um, I think with creative practices, it's great when you've got uh, other people to share it with, but it's also okay if it's just something that you kind of have a, have a go at and don't necessarily share. I'm sure you've done many, many experimental things as well. And I think that's almost another rule for creativity if we had one is just to kind of like take absolute pleasure in failing because um it's almost like a, a lottery sometimes you've got to take 100 punts and if you do i'm sure one of them will, will succeed so um it might not be this novel that makes it but maybe um another one down the road and you're that much closer for everyone you try yeah i i mean i guess there's a yeah that that line is quite hard to find sometimes because there's experimental stuff which you go 
and try and you're like oh no this doesn't work or something but sometimes it is actually worthwhile releasing it because it turns out people do like it and then other times it's definitely you think it's great and it actually no one likes it <laughs> it's like that <laughs> hard so true I don't, I'll, I'll ask you um because you released your first game now must have been whew, three years ago is it almost you're absolutely right yeah, yeah. 2018 i think yeah. it was the very month that we met Thailand. yes it was <laughs> <laughs> so um so about three um years ago tell me when you released that game what went through your head <laughs> Wow. So um, this is uh, you're referring, of course, to Crystal Hall, which was released yes. by Gibson's The Publishers. And this, oh my goodness, it was such an exhilarating feeling to, to, to have that out there. So this was um, uh, at the time stocked by John Lewis, obviously a, a great national retailer, um, as well as Gibson's. And it was um, uh, sold by Amazon online and, and was a, a number one, uh, uh, I think it's called, called an Amazon Choice, I think, when it does well on there. And I was blown away and uh incredibly humbled by the the success uh that that it, that it had um it uh yeah it meant so much to me because I, and i suppose it, it comes back to that idea of an inner child so when i was a kid i would joke with my mates about oh yeah dream job would be to be someone who makes uh lego models or someone who does the illustrations for the beano comic or somebody who uh, writes for marvel something like that we talk about that stuff but I would never think in my wildest dreams that it would be possible to do that stuff. But actually, if I look back at my career, I've worked as an accountant. What I've done in the evenings is a bit like that blank page time at university is I've always made sure I, I stay in touch with that inner child and kind of um, make time in the evenings to, to do some, some doodles, um, to just sketch out little ideas, fail and experiment. Um, and I feel like because I've always had that little, those little pockets of time going back to, to when I really was that kid playing with Lego and reading the Beano, it's meant that it's really fulfilling for this kind of like later act in the story where you get that, that payoff for having nurtured the inner child all those years. So um, yeah, I guess it just kind of, it's a, it was a feeling of absolute fulfillment and thank goodness I, um, uh, yeah, I, I stayed in touch with my inner child. Um yeah, and, and I know it's, it's, it's funny when you're in an interview like this, it kind of brings thoughts to the surface you might not otherwise think of. Um, I've actually got a really weird almost confession, um, which might sound a bit strange. So when I was in um, university in first year, I kind of thought, you know, I'm not sure this is right for me. This doesn't feel right. And I, I did this really, 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 really weird thing um, where I basically got my hand and I was I started like just talking to it. And I don't know if this just says about like how I don't know, isolated I felt that I was just like, what if we did this? What if we did that? And I, I remember like the hand just like turned to me at one point and basically just said like, it's going to be okay. You're going to do some really awesome creative stuff. And like, it basically just said something that made me feel okay inside and I feel vulnerable sharing this story because it's just so bizarre but at the same time I had that like seed of hope that uh, everything was going to be okay um, at, that was planted at university and then I think that moment really weirdly when I was in bed just talking to my hand <laughs> was what kind of like kept me through the kind of um, the, the time when I was uh, doing accountancy and then like working the evenings on creative stuff that then resulted in that um, climactic release of uh, uh, of the game across stores nationwide um, in 2018. So yeah, it was incredibly fulfilling because I, I could kind of see the kind of the story backwards and like how this kind of promise I'd made myself in a very childish way had somehow come true. I mean, um, I'd say one of the things which I think a lot of people struggle with is that work and like fun balance and stuff like that. And you seem to have managed to have somehow succeeded in kind of going into the accountant world, but saying, no, actually, I want to do this still. <laughs> Whereas I know a lot of people get so burnt out by their work that they really struggle, therefore, to keep whatever their passions are. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, if the hand thing works for you, go for it. Like, it basically, I, I, I wouldn't like... <laughs> I wouldn't put it down or anything. Sounds like a great technique, a great coping mechanism. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I, I, it's funny because it's, I've not, not sort of been conscious about it, but yeah, if it, if it it's led to this, so I, I'm not going to change, I guess. Yeah. Um, it reminds me a little bit of um, sometimes coders um, will have a rubber duck on their desk. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this idea, but the idea is that 
if you're really stuck on your coding problem, just try and make it simple enough to explain to a rubber duck and it will almost allow kind of um, the, the truth of the problem to come to the surface. So maybe my hand is uh, my, my rubber duck um, in some ways. Like it's almost that kind of like little sounding board that you, I carry with me to, to help me kind of like work through problems. I've got some other thoughts about organization. Maybe I could share those. Yeah, I guess um, the, the, there's kind of a few kind of like, uh, I guess, uh, in popular culture, like techniques that I, I quite like um, that you may have come across. One is the Pomodoro technique. Have you heard of this one? So uh, Pomodoro, I believe, is a Spanish word for tomato. And it's basically based on a tomato timer, which is a, a, a tomato shaped uh, kind of kitchen timer that you can time for 25 minutes. And the idea is that you break up your day into half hour chunks where you have 25 minutes of working, five minutes of break. And that's what I do on my non-working days so that uh, I can work on my board game stuff. And I'll have little tasks that I chunk out for those 25 minutes. And it, it's, it's really funny because if it's a task that you really can't be bothered with, it's really dry, it's um, sorting out loads of admin or looking up some legal thing, um, you're only doing it for 25 minutes. Like the end's in sight. You can, you can grit your teeth and make it through 25 minutes. And if it's something that you enjoy, and my favorite part of my job is, is when I get to do watercolor paintings of new ideas. And um, when I'm doing that and I have to stop after 25 minutes, it's a weird uh, th thing to break your own flow and just put down your, your, your paintbrush. But there's a kind of uh, a really nice excitement that sits with you uh, inside when you get to think about coming back to that activity. It's almost like you've... I don't know, pause to save game at a really exciting place, mm -hmm. or you've like had just one bite of a chocolate bar and you're saving it for later. So that, so I think the Pomodoro technique is something that um, yeah works for me and, and I enjoy. I mean, that sounds great. I mean, the one, I think the thing which I do struggle with is like kind of when there's stuff which I enjoy, I do it for hours and hours and stuff like that. And when there's something which I don't enjoy, I just put it off consistently. <laughs> so, but... I think a friend told me that about learning stuff is also good to use the 25 minute technique or something like that. Cause they said, um, say for example, if you want to learn guitar, right. Um, learning guitar takes ages as does the keyboard, any instruments, they take ages to learn. Sadly, no one's going to pick it up and just suddenly be slash. It's not going to happen. Um, we can but, dream. <laughs> we can dream. Yeah. Um, but, um, whether you're enjoying it or disliking it, it's better to do like just a 30 minutes a day or something initially, because then you want to go back to it. And that's much better than if you do an hour of it and then you're exhausted at the end and you just don't want to go back to it. So, so relate to that. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's those little bite sized manageable pieces that you don't get kind of a sense of despair about the, the, the enormity of the task and also a bit of that saving something for later, which I, I do quite like. Um, sometimes I will just run on and, and, and dive into the painting for hours because I'll, I'll um, not want it to dry. Um, but, but I do really like that, that, that splitting up of time. That's something that has really helped me with the, the discipline that I think you need. So we're talking about inner child today, but there's also like your inner adult. And I feel sometimes that there's like a, a kind of a stern inner adult who's just like, now, now, John, you've got to structure your day. And you, if you don't do this, you won't get to do that fun stuff. Um, so uh, yeah, I've got, I've certainly got that, that inner voice to me as well. Um, and another kind of quick tip that I like, like is the, the two minute rule. So if you've got something that um, will take less than two minutes to do, like maybe a, a little email or um, sending someone something, um, like just, just get it done in the moment. Because by the time you've kind of popped it on a to-do list and then like written the due date or whatever, um, you, you could have done it. So yeah. um, that's, that's another nice little practical tip. Yeah. I mean, I think your connection with chocolate is probably the best because in my experience with chocolate, the first bite is always the best. Like your second bite is never as good as the first, unless of course you were to leave it, then it might be. But um, <laughs> like... That's, that's so true. Like I think they call it the the hedonistic treadmill. I think you get mm. diminishing returns on the uh, on a on a pleasure if you keep repeating it, and repeating it. So I guess maybe in some ways it's good to advocate just having that very first maximum uh, dosage, and then the idea of having that 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 second bite can um, be almost as attractive. I guess sometimes uh, I've got a bit of a. a a kind of a protestant work ethic i kind of like like to do jobs the day i get it and like uh I look forward to to things a lot in the future um so yeah i think um i'm i am somebody who likes to just have two 
two squares of of dark chocolate each day and mm. like that's that's enough for me but knowing i've got that extra chocolate in the cupboard which i know you some really people need are just to like, teach how me do do how that? to restrain myself because <laughs> <laughs> i am not good at that <laughs> but yeah <laughs> yeah oh, yeah it, it, it's tricky i guess um like all of the things that we're talking about it's just kind of a, a matter of practice and habit and discipline if you can and um another good organizational technique is that if you're trying to adopt a new habit is to just do one tiny version of that thing so um mindfulness is hugely popular at the moment and if, i've heard this uh, idea of like just doing a single breath mindfully um just kind of just taking that single moment to just kind of to be and experience that and try and be aware of your thoughts it's not going to change your um mindset kind of overnight but i think that just making it really, really achievable can sometimes give you the momentum if you have like three days in a row of doing that or flossing one tooth is another one or doing maybe just one press up if that's what you want to do. Um, it gives you that sense of, yeah, we can do this. We've got that momentum. Let, let's let's go for it. And before you know it, things might might snowball. So yeah, I, I like that that organizational tip too. Yeah. I mean, one thing I, I will say actually is because um, I, I know that you like obviously your games and stuff like that. I love my games. My Switch literally just sits here on my desk. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> but well, <laughs> have I you mean, got yours? It is not <laughs> it's far right away next... at all. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one of the things I will say is if I'm feeling lazy, I will spend a lot of time on my Switch and stuff like that. And I have great fun with it. Um, how do you restrain yourself from like just not playing games consistently and like getting a healthy balance of games? Because I don't want to make it sound like obviously that games aren't unhealthy because I think there is a lot to game with games, but you know. <laughs> yeah, I think um, what I'd probably advocate is like self-awareness. Mm -hmm. So um, being able to step back and almost uh, look at your your whole kind of uh, life on a weekly basis, I think is quite good. So if you see that you're doing a bit of gaming, like, uh, maybe half an hour, five days a week, and it looks balanced to you, like that's cool. If you're looking back and it says, like, maybe it's a little bit more than you're comfortable with. And um, maybe there's certain things that you feel like are um, falling behind because of, of what you're doing, then um, that's going to help you. So I think it's great to have certain days where you just get really stuck into the game, get loads of escapism, get a sense of flow. Um, but yeah, I guess it's just kind of like taking that step back at the, and seeing the bigger picture is, is always really, really helpful. I do think that it's it's great to have time to to immerse yourself in things because i feel like sometimes your brain needs to um almost do like a waking kind of sleep where you you almost like it defragments all the kind of thoughts and like um maybe things uh kind of resolve themselves in a different way so and i certainly find i get that from playing uh games i'm playing a, a great game called slay the spire at the moment which is a kind of a deck building uh roguelike uh, dungeon crawler and uh I think I nearly always know what I'm going to do when, I, when I'm presented with a, a set of moves. I'm like, oh, that, that, that. And it's almost like an algorithm in myself takes over. But when I'm playing the game, in the back of my mind, I think part of me is thinking about earth and war and uh, relationships and work. And it's kind of working things out in the, in the background. So I, I, I guess I allow myself to play a little bit because I, I think that a little bit of it, a certain amount of it is healthy. So, yeah. Love games. I mean, that, that fits perfectly um, into how I was before the pandemic, going to concerts consistently. I sadly lost them, hoping they'll come back at some point. Oh, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, like that was my main thing. So I guess, um, uh, but like, um, I totally agree with that on the way how I used to in general. I think when I was working at Sixth Form, it was quite stressful. I just every night, whether or not, I remember one night I decided like, no, I'm just going to revise and stuff like that. And it backfired massively and I had just loads of anxiety. And then from then on, I just every night went, okay, I'm going to watch a film tonight. And it was just like that. It was like always the end of the day type of thing of just saying, just watch a film, just switch your brain off from all that kind of work stuff and just get immersed in yeah. something. And um, I'll agree with you. It's very therapeutic, extremely therapeutic. <laughs> yeah, I totally hear you. And you just reminded me of something that I used to do um, when I was very stressed about um, work. So I had to do these accountancy exams, which were really, really tough. They, they really stretched me. And there was um, 
you, there was kind of a threat of maybe having to, to leave your job if you didn't complete them. So there's quite a lot of pressure. Um, and when I was doing those, I would play Tetris. So that was my kind of um, coping mechanism at the time. I would do something like 25 minutes using the Pomodoro technique again of, of work and the five minute break. And it was just so incredibly soothing. So I think games can play a, a great role in um, in calming us and then giving us that, that 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 well-being boost and that that distraction, allowing the almost like the dust to settle a little bit of the day, so you can then go back the, the next day and, and kind of revisit things afresh. So yeah, I think gaming's really really powerful in that way. Yeah, I mean um, Tetris ninety nine. <laughs> if you played Tetris ninety nine on Switch, <laughs> I. I've, I've not played it that much. Is that where you play against 99 other people? Yeah. Um, wow. <laughs> that, that's intense. But I guess the problem with that is um, occasionally you end up getting kicked out like really early and then you're just, you're just you can't take that as like your only round. <laughs> you're like, no, I need another round. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's interesting yeah i guess like it's it's having that bigger picture sense um so like kind of maybe allowing yourself to play a few more times if you've been mm. kicked out early um and yeah getting that that balance right yeah why don't we talk about some of your favorite games some of the things which throughout your childhood have been like or well and adulthood um just stuff which has i think had good inf- big influence on your current creativity to your current games and stuff i guess like uh it's a, st- a story that i that is uh, another one of my origin stories is when I was uh, growing up, my family would uh, play and invent a lot of games. So um, one example is that we once got loads of shoe boxes and planks of wood, paper mache the whole thing and painted lots of little circles on it. And uh, the whole family had these counters with different stickers on. And it was basically snakes and ladders on steroids and three-dimensional. And I don't know if you know those strange little toys, which are like a stick with like a snapping shark at the end and like a little trigger that you pull. There was one of those uh, in a can of Pringles on a certain square and it was all paper mache up. So it kind of looked like part of the terrain. And like, if you landed on that square, the shark would bite you. And it was just completely over the top in an amazing celebratory way like why would you invent this game um like it, it, it's kind of takes a lot of time and investment but the kind of the experience of looking back at this glorious three-dimensional thing with um like all these um bridges and the, the shark and like customized pieces was just it just uh, gave me that sense of wonder. Like we spoke at the top of the show about um, the sense of opening a new box of Lego and that excitement that you get. It gave me that that same raw excitement. Um, so that's one example. Another example, which um, I, I often like talking about, is um, Tripopoly. So the same uh, group of family members um, used to get three Monopoly boards and play Monopoly all in one giant universe. So you landed on Go or Free Parking, you went to a parallel universe, you have more money, um, um, it was completely over the top, but again, kind of glorious and and uh, it was fun because it was it was so new and different. And it did it did help that there were sweets on free parking as well if you landed on that square. So it just kind of showed me that like you don't have to accept things at face value. You don't have to play boring snakes and ladders. You can play stupidly over the top snakes and ladders. You can play stupidly over the top um, Monopoly. And I feel like. That's one thing that I often think about, if I'm uh, honest with you, Tyler, is that I feel like a lot of people underestimate the possibilities that are out there. Like, if you look at what you could do with uh, film or with um, games or with storytelling, there's so many crazy things that we could be doing. And it's great that you, you're embracing experimentalism. I really admire that about you. And I think we need to have more of that almost in the, in the world. Um, so yeah, those, those are two games from my childhood. And, and I guess kind of like, uh, reflecting back on kind of recent years, the, the number one game that I enjoy playing from other people is a game called Dominion, which is a uh, deck building card game. And I, I won't explain all the rules here, but one of the, the things that I really like about it is every time you play, you get a whole bunch of different cards to play with and they all interact in different ways. And you get that sense of being a a chef who's cooking up a strategy from different ingredients that I really, really enjoy. And you can be creative as a player. So you can be like, oh, if I put this laboratory with that uh, village card and that witch card, I get a really cool deck that's going to destroy my opponent and let me do something that maybe has never been done before in the history of time. I mean, it's cool to think 
think about a, a bunch of playing cards. If you shuffle them, you'll probably get an arrangement that's never been done before. And I like that. I love that that wonder of um of, of originality that you can get with 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 games. So yeah, that that's kind of um recent reflections on on games that i like you've reminded me of kind of my childhood 3d games which were like mouse trap and all of those ones which always yes. have the excitement <laughs> like <laughs> oh my days the excitement of seeing a, a mouse trap set that was a yeah. game that we didn't have at home but mm-hmm. like um when i went to someone's house or or i think sunday school had one when we saw it there and played it it was so so fun like three dimensionality as a kid is it's so novel and and having that game element yeah I, there should be more 3d games out there yeah no i um i'd also interestingly you spoke about um obviously like what sounds like the most steroid version of snakes on ladders i think i've ever heard i don't know why i was expecting normal <laughs> examples but that sounds amazing um i also played a weird steroid snakes and ladders game which like had five levels and it was at i think it was at my great wow. aunt's house and you were marbles and the snakes were tubes so if you went on a snake tube then it would it shoot down oh my like, goodness Tyler, i'd love to see photos i don't of know what it, it was called amazing. and i want to find it because it was so good <laughs> we've only played it once in my life but it, it's that that it had that much of an impact that's how much of an impact something like a 3d game can kind of have i think on you and um you're totally right like i think we i mean to me monopoly is like one of the most dull games i've ever heard but then you say like oh three boards and stuff i was like oh okay that could be interesting <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah it, it 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 was um something that uh i think made our family a bit different like monopoly's uh, notorious for kind of like creating arguments but i think it kind of brought us together in a, in a weird way um and i remember like um my cousins like uh, doing like funny things when they're doing deals. Like by, they might say, "Oh, I'll give you a hundred for Old Kent Road," and then someone might say no, and then you go, "Oh, wait, what's this up my sleeve? Another hundred pounds? How about now?" Like <laughs> they would kind of bring a bit of theatre and banter into it. Mm. That um, yeah, like just kind of showed the kind of sportsmanship and 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 humour that and I, I guess I just really admired. Um, so yeah. We don't have to accept games at face value. We can make them even more fun. And yeah, I, I would love to to see other games taken to, to the next level and remixed um, because there's, there's so many more games waiting to be made. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that sounds amazing. So let's lead into your game, Earth and War. I have actually had the pleasure of playing this once um, with my dad. There's a lot of strategy to it, let's say, uh, but it's very well done, I think. So, John, if you want to just explain, I guess, briefly what this, how you play this game and what it is. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's a two-player strategy combat game. So maybe think about chess if you're trying to imagine this at home. And uh, except there's only two pieces on the board. There's maybe just one king and another king, again, using that analogy. But also imagine that, you control your one king on the board by using another mini board, which is like your control pad. So you know when you're playing a, a video game, you've got your 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 control pad that controls your your avatar, your piece. That's kind of what you've got in Earth and War. You've got this little control pad, except the way in which that works is unlike anything I think anyone's ever seen in the game before, to be totally frank with you. You, you use dice and slide them around to make your golem slide around and do different moves. So you might have a number two at the front um, of your grid, and that means that your golem can move forwards two squares. Or you might have a, a black dice at the right-hand side of your grid, and that means that your golem can do an attack one square to to the right. So that's roughly how it works, um, using ideas of magic there. And it's got actual clay pieces because it's obviously a pun on earthenware um, and the pieces are golems. So um, yeah, we've tried to make it a kind of a bit, a bit different and a bit, bit fun. Um, uh, and yeah, it, it's, a, it's a strategy game that hopefully scratch that itch for, for people who like to, to play that kind of game. When are we expecting it to come out? Well, I really hope that we can get it out this summer. So we're, we're kind of slowly um, finalizing some bits. Uh, so where we are right now is um, we're working on the back of the box and we're also working on the front of the box. We've got a concept artist who's doing some spectacular work that you can check out on the uh, Facebook Earth and War page. If you go to facebook.com slash Earth and War, you can see the work in progress art there. There's more coming uh, in color, which I'm really excited about. Um, so when we finalize all our bits, 
bits of artwork. We're going to send off um, some orders to China to get uh, 15 preview copies that we're going to hopefully send to some reviewers and get some, some, some thoughts from them, hopefully generate a bit of a buzz. And then uh, it's come summertime at some point, we're really hoping to hit launch on Kickstarter. And hopefully uh, some people will out there will, will uh, respond to it and resonate with it and, uh, and, and support it. And then we can hopefully ship out the game and, and share it with the world. So nice. watch this space in summertime. And in the meantime, check us out on Facebook. I didn't actually point this out, but I, I, I thought we might as well mention the way how you initially tested this because I, I was one of, me and my dad, the reason why I played the game is me and my dad were one of the test subjects initially. Um, so explain to me, I, I probably should have asked this before, but explain to me kind of, yeah, getting it tested out in a pandemic because I think you had quite a, I would say it's quite a unique <laughs> idea that how the way how you got it tested, considering the fact we were all in lockdown at the time. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's funny actually reflecting yeah. on it now. Um, yeah. We did something that I don't think has been done before. We, we basically did the world's biggest game of Pass the Parcel that I'm aware of. So mm-hmm. Tyler was uh, very kind to, 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 to test it. And he was part of a, a postal chain of people in different countries, some in Germany, some in the US, some in Canada, who were posting this game to each other we actually had five or six copies on the road at any one point in time uh, some of them are actually still out there getting us uh, feedback which is quite fun and um yeah so we obviously we couldn't sadly meet in person to go to a, a pub or a cafe or play testing place uh, to play it so it was sent to people in their homes that actually worked really well for, for us because we got really diverse feedback, people from different countries uh, feeding in their thoughts. And it was really great to just get those different perspectives. Um, No matter how much you try and design things in your bedroom at home or sitting on the carpet with a mate, nothing um, will give you that that feedback like putting in front of a person and getting that that, that feedback to, to help you craft it. Because it's it's a very difficult to, to empathize with all people and put yourself in all the personas of all possible players. But when you you put something in front of somebody and you get that instant feedback, it just makes things a bit quicker. So that's a little bit about what we've done with the testing. We've also been testing a little bit in person pre pandemic. Uh, we've been working on it for a few years now. A bit of a slow burn game, um, but it was re- an absolute joy to to send it out to people. And and I think it might be nice for people to have that tactile thing of oh something's arriving in the post and there's little mod- models with the texture that I know it, it's it's a bit of a different novel experience when many things are the same. To me, it was extremely exciting when it turned up, and it's like this weird thing the only thing which was slightly annoying about it was that i had to obviously give it away again <laughs> i'll oh. just keep it um, but um uh, yeah no we'll i have to I give would... you another one <laughs> please do <laughs> uh, but, um, i i'd highly recommend you do it again i think um as a way of getting diverse groups of different people and um i mean I I haven't I'm not someone who's in general actually would go to like a board game cafe and stuff probably to check that out. Granted, I might do that more often post pandemic, but we'll see what happens. Um, but I'm not someone who has done that before, so I wouldn't be someone who would normally test that type of thing out. So you end up with quite a big range of people by just saying. Does anyone want to try a game in their house in the comfort of their home? Yeah, that, it, it's so true. I think you raise a really good point that I think we hadn't. We just kind of did in the moment as a reaction to circumstances, but like maybe we're onto something a little bit here. So I think we'll definitely bear that in mind for like the rest of the game and, and future games as well, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, no, th- thanks for that feedback. Is there anything else you'd like to mention? Anything you don't think we've covered or... I think I think that's, that's the main thing. So um, if you're interested in uh, finding out more about the, the game, do check out Earth and War um, on the Facebook page or um, on Instagram. There's an at Earth and War uh, page you can check out or, or my personal one at John Power 1988. But um, yeah, I, I, I guess I would just close and wrap up by saying like i really hope everyone can make that time to stay in touch with their inner child and Mm. and rediscover that feeling of anything is possible that you get when you open that that brand new box of lego and there's sheer kind of like overwhelming sense of possibilities that that comes with that so look around you folks and and see what are the new possibilities that it could be sitting right under your nose. And that is possibly the most tempting pitch I've ever heard to just go and buy some Lego right now. <laughs> okay, yeah, Lego um, sales just walk yeah. it up. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed that video. Let me know what you think down below and the crowdfunder is in the description.